What's up guys, Lundic here and now I'm back with the special History of Monday Night Raw Q&A So I put this video out a few weeks ago, got, got a few questions, now I'm going to do it I was going to do this last week but I just got busy and I just couldn't be bothered to do it Then I thought okay alright there's an opportunity here, what if I do it on the day of Raw 30 which is happening tonight um, so obviously I know it's not actually the 30th anniversary of Raw now, that was January the 11th But I thought this is as good a time as any to do it on the day before the Raw 30 show Which looks like it could be a pretty good show So yeah, you know you know how this works don't you? You've sent the questions, I'll read them out, I'll give me answers the best I can, simple as So yeah, let's just, let's just get right into it really We're going to start off with Radical Velocity um, were you a fan of the run DX had on Raw in 06? Not really. I mean, at the time, I thought it was quite exciting when I knew DX were getting back together. And I can't shit on the run too much because, let's face it, it was over as fuck. I mean, if you just go back and watch those shows, DX in 2006 were over as hell. And they sold a shitload of merchandise in that time, so... It was kind of a nice nostalgia run, but for me, the run just... Because, especially coming from someone who watched the original DX run back in the day, um, I think the, the problem was things had changed so much in 2006 to what they were in 97, 98, especially with the two guys, Triple H and Shawn Michaels. Yeah, because they were older now. I mean, Shawn was over 40, Triple H wasn't too far off. And... It was just kind of like, you know, when, when your parents tried to act cool and be down with the kids, but they're obviously not. And so, like, say, when you were, like, 13, 14, 15, when you were at the age where you start getting embarrassed by your parents trying to be cool, that's kind of what it felt like to me. Um, and also, like, Sean Michaels was the born-again Christian now, uh, was if, if you allegedly... Um, so he couldn't really do the raunchy stuff and the whole thing about DX was anti-establishment well in 2006 Triple H was the establishment he was married, married still is obviously married to the McMahon family and all that um, so yeah I didn't really love it to be honest with you I, obviously I didn't hate it but to me it just kind of felt a bit lame although admittedly it was pretty damn over Um was he ever a celebrity guest host that you hoped to see show up in Raw? Well, The Rock for one, because that, that had to be on the cards at some point. Because uh, I don't know how many people remember, do you remember the 10th anniversary of SmackDown episode in 2009? Um, can't, I think from, it must have been September, maybe late August, I can't remember exactly when. The Rock um, had, a, had a promo sent in from wherever he was at the time, and he actually spoke about... Um, TT's guest host and wrote that point. So it seemed at that point um there was a there was a potential on the cards of the rock to come back sooner than he did. Um but never materialised for whatever reason. We never saw the rock for another year until early 2011. So that would have been cool. So kind of one for me, which would have been pretty awesome, but I don't think like most Americans would have really given a shite about it. Um, if, if, if they came to England and someone like Wayne Rooney did it, because obviously my United fan, Rooney was the best player at the club at the time, my favourite footballer at the time. Um, so that would have been pretty interesting for someone like that. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember who was guest host at the time they came to England. I just can't remember about who definitely wasn't Rooney. I know that for a fact because I would have remembered that. Um, so, yeah, I think that one would have been pretty cool. As far as, like, American celebrities, nobody really stands out as someone I really wanted to see, to be fair. Then we got... Okay, that is a good one. What was your favourite Raw during the Ruthless Aggression era and why? This is probably going to be a standard answer. I think most people would say the same thing. And that's the Raw Homecoming show in uh, October 2005. It was called Raw Homecoming because Raw was going back to USA Network after five years on TNN slash Spike TV. And this was kind of... For, this is me, it was probably the first time I really remember them loading up Raw to be a pay-per-view quality show. Um, I believe, I could be wrong, 
but I believe this was the first ever three hour Raw and to say this show was loaded would be a hell of an understatement I mean just the lineup they had I mean they had so much going on in this show I mean you had it started off with Piper's Pit with Mick Foley um, with Randy Orton and Bob Orton getting involved you had a Really good uh, 30 minute Iron Man match between Kurt Angle and Shawn Michaels. Okay, grant the Austin McMahon segment went on forever and kind of sucked, um, to be fair. You had an uh, edged Matt Hardy in a loser leaves Raw ladder match. That was a good match, I don't think that was a great match. Um, you had the angle where they were going to have a six man tag SmackDown match and Eric Bischoff shut down because they didn't want to have SmackDown on Raw's air. And that kicked off the Raw vs Smackdown angle which would culminate a Survivor Series. I believe it was Batista Guerrero. Hmm, who was it? But I mean, it was JBL Ken Kennedy and someone else. I can't remember what the actual Smackdown match was supposed to be. I want to say Mysterio was probably in there. Might have been Randy Orton. I can't the ones the ones I definitely remember was it was Batista, Eddie Guerrero, Mr. Kennedy and JBL were all in it. Um then you had uh, what else did we have on this show? Oh Triple H coming back after some time off and then turn on Rick Flair. That was actually a great heel turn to be fair. That was probably one that probably maybe the most underrated Triple H heel turn ever. And then grant the main event of Cena versus Bischoff was what it was. Nothing really exciting. And then you obviously had a Hulk Hogan segment in there as well. So yeah, this just felt like a big, big raw. And I would say most people would probably say give the same answer. And then what do you think was the biggest draft mistake Raw ever made? Um I think in the original one, I think the obvious answer was splitting up the Dudleys with Bubba Ray going to Raw. Raw and Devon going to SmackDown. I mean, at the time, thing pan fans just weren't done for Dudley's act. Fans weren't really ready to embrace Bubba Ray and Devon as singles acts. I don't think they did badly as singles acts in 2002, but it was obvious right from the start, people just really wanted to see the Dudley boys. And then obviously, uh, that happened because the Dudley boys reunited Survivor Series that year. I would say another one. How do you remember? Do you remember how point? I think it was 2011. Uh, but the start, I think the first draft pick that night was Cena going to SmackDown. And then the last pick was Cena going back to Raw. So it's like, you've literally just wasted three hours of our time on that. And now we're back to exactly where we were at the start of the show with John Cena. I just felt that one was pretty pointless, if we're being honest. And then we got. Jimmy Reviews and Archives, what was your initial reaction when the announcement was made that Raw was going to three hours moving forward? Oh, oh, just a sense of dread, really. It's like, really? Three hours every week? I, I, my first thought was Nitro 98. And that was kind of one of the big factors where WCW started going downhill. Because... Now we've got a two hour Nitro, now we've got three hours Nitro. So my reaction wasn't a positive one and that was what, ten and a half years ago and I don't think I was wrong about that because obviously Raw being three hours isn't the only factor is why Raw isn't as good as it used to be. But it has to be a massive factor and can you honestly tell me creatively Raw's been better over the last ten years than the previous ten years? No. Um, so yeah, I didn't like it then. I don't like it now. I think we'll have another question about Raw being three hours at some point during the video. Though. Um, so, your favourite Raw theme song? I bet you're going to think I'm going to say the Raw's War Falling in Your Eye song, aren't you? However, you're wrong. That, that was a great theme, but I think an even better one was a Union Underground one uh, in the Ruthless Aggression days. You know which one I'm on about. Uh, the one that um, debuted in 2002, and I want to say it lasted till about, I want to say 2006, definitely 2005, but I think it went all the way to like 2006, when I think the Papa Roach one took over, if I remember rightly, but yeah, that, that move to the, the, is it Cross the Nation, the song's called, I believe, from Union Underground. That was an awesome theme song, to be fair. God, what a time that was. That was a raw theme song in Marilyn Manson, Beautiful People. It was a Smackdown theme. Awesome, awesome. Then, favourite raw set 
uh, arena set. Pfft, that that's the classic Raw's War one. You know, you know the one with the big metal ram, the big giant Titan Tron. And um, yeah, I love that one. Up, yeah, that that's just so I visually iconic, isn't it? And um, I think a close second would be the the one the two thousand and two one to about. Yeah, so the Roof of Aggression one was really good too, um, but the the classic Raw's War one is the best. Now, this is going to be a good, this is a good Christ. so do you have a rank a list of the best to worst post-WrestleMania episodes of all time? So I'm going to try and be as brief as possible, because for me this kind of goes into the video, the uh, question that requires its own video. So I'm not going to go along for this one, I'm going to be trying as quickly as possible. So what I've done is, I went back on all my Raw reviews, because I've reviewed every Raw after WrestleMania for the exception of this way, this year. So I've gone back at them, looked at what ratings that I personally gave them, and then I've ranked them like that. So obviously Raws have the same rate, and I've just decided in my head which one was better there and then. So using my own, so using my own stuff, I want to tell you, so I've, there's 28 of these here because I haven't watched this year's and I don't really particularly want to. Maybe in the future. So I've come, I came up with the conclusion that number 28 was 2021, which I rated 3.5 out of 10. Then I rated the following two, two out of, uh, no, I give them four out of 10. So 27 was 2020 show. Coming in at number 26 was 1993. Then a uh, 25 was um, 1994, which I gave a 5 out of 10. And then we got... Then we got the 2007, coming in at number 24. Then we got a... Uh, 23 is 2019. Number 22 is 2018. Number 21 is 2006. Number 20, 2009. This one was a surprise, actually. Number 19, 2001. So I've got two, which I gave a 6.5 out of 10. So 2001, all the way in 19th place. Um, and number 80, 1996. Number 17, I've got 2013. Number 16, I've got 2004. So now on the top 15, 2000. Uh, 2003 in number 15, and so we got 2017 in number 14, 2016 in number 16. Surprisingly enough, 1995 in number 12, I actually thought that was a pretty good raw, to, to be fair. then the, So now the top 10, so what are the top 10? So this is quite interesting. Well, I think it's fairly interesting anyway. So, number 10 is 2011. Number 9 is 2000. Number 8 is 2015, which I was surprised to realise. Number 8 is 2000. No, I've already said 2015, haven't I? Number 7, 2012. Okay. Now the top 6. Yeah, number 6 is 1999. I mean, that was, yeah, I, I enjoyed that raw, sue me. So the top five is interesting. Uh, a couple in there I didn't expect to be in there, but I went back. Looked at me researching all that. Number five is 1997. Number four is 2002. All the way up third, 2014. Then surprisingly, number two, 2008. And number one, I didn't even need to think about that one, to be fair. 1998. That, for me, not only is that the best post Raw WrestleMania ever, it's the best Raw ever, in my opinion. Then we got... Which of the two ex yeah, try again. Which of the two field experiments do you prefer? Raw Underground or Brawl for All? I was, honestly Raw Underground I don't think Raw Underground was that bad. They just didn't give a time. It could, it's one of those things that was a decent idea in theory, but the, the execution wasn't quite right. And WWE just didn't give it a chance. I mean, if it was done right, it could have been a really interesting part of the show. And you could have had some neat little storylines on that portion of the show. But it just didn't really work. Um, and But they didn't really give it time to work. I mean, Brawl for All was just a shit idea from the start. And thank the Lord, Brawl for All was, happened in 98 and never happened again. But, yeah, honestly, I do actually feel like Raw Underground could have been... 
something a lot better than it was, a lot bigger than it was, but we'll never know because he pulled the plug after what six weeks at the two months at the most. Um yeah. So um Prince of Strong Style 9 V2. So top five title changes in raw history. So I do have a list here which I'm gonna go through. So be quite a few title changes in raw history. So I'm gonna do the top five. Number five is an interesting one. Um, and that's where Marty Jannetty beating Shawn Michaels for the Intercontinental title in May 1993. Believe this was the first ever title win in the history of Raw. Believe it is. Um, but for me, it was that Raw was actually great because you had the Razor One Two Three Kid moment on there. And that because back in the back in this era, you didn't really see impromptu matches. That just didn't happen. The card was set, and that was that. There was no real surprise of what matches were on the show. So that show started with Shawn Michaels cutting a pro. Marty Jannetty returned after being fired. God knows how many times at this point. But it was in one of Marty's infamous hire and rehire and stages, which happened a lot over the years. So Ginetti came back, confronted Shawn Michaels. Then an impromptu match was made right there. That match was fucking awesome as well. Shawn Michaels, Marty Ginetti, fantastic Raw match. And that led to Ginetti upsetting Shawn Michaels to win his only title in the WWF. No, I tell a lie. He's only single. Oh no, him and one two three could do the tag champs as well. Okay, he's only singles title, and that's probably the way because Matty Jannetty arguably be one of the most least memorable Intercontinental Champions of all time. Had the belt for less than a month and didn't do anything of any note of the belt at all. But it was a great moment. It was a rare time where Jannetty got one over on Shawn Michaels. Now, next one could be an interesting one, and that's Psycho Sid becoming the WWF Champion in February 1997. Oh, that was, this is the first world title change in the history of Raw. That was just a weird week, wasn't it? That was the week after Shawn Michaels lost his smile, vacated the title. Then the title became on the line at the final four pay-per-view, which Brett won. Then he defended the belt the next night on Raw against Sid. And then Sid became the champion. And that led to uh, Bret and Austin at WrestleMania. And Sid uh, facing The Undertaker for the title. Um, what I love I love this Raw actually. Because that was a really cool story all night. So Bret and Sid were first supposed to open the show. But Austin attacked Bret backstage. And then ruined the match. And then they got the bear. They were, then they were going to wrestle I think, probably on the top of the hour. So Bret and Sid was going to happen in the middle of the show again. Austin uh, delays the match again by uh, physically getting involved again. And then it finally happens in the main event of the show. Um, that, that was just kind of the chaotic, chaotic stuff that um, WF was just starting to do and starting to change the creative direction a bit. Then we eventually got the match and yet and Sid became... Sid is, Sid is known in history as the first man to win the WWE title on Monday Night Raw. There you go. Number three, Dolph Ziggler cashing in Money in the Bank the night after WrestleMania 29, 2013 to beat Alberto Del Rio to become the World Heavyweight Champion. That We're going to go back to this one later on in the video because there's questions. This is this kind of comes up in another question. But yeah, that was great. And just the monstrous prop Dolph Ziggler got on all that brilliant stuff. And then number two, both in the same year, funnily enough, that Stone Cold winning the WWF title the night after King of the Ring against The Undertaker. I mean, do you know what's weird? Austin is a six-time WWF champion, right? But he's only ever won the title in a WrestleMania or a Raw. Um, Austin, I think, is the only man to win three world titles on Raw, doing it in 98. He, and ironically enough, the night after King of the Ring, 1998 as well. So, 98, here... And then in 2001 against Kurt Angle. Oh, this was a, this is when Dude Ref was on fire, really. Um, it was a great little setup as well. It was actually a really smart piece of writing. So Austin was the CEO of the WWF. He was putting that on the line against Vince Shane. And Austin, knowing there was an excellent chance he was going to get screwed out of the King of the Ring and no longer have his, had his power, before the King of the Ring signed, it, signed himself in a WWF title match for this show, um, so even though the McMahons had full power in the WWF, Austin had one over on them. He was one step ahead. Obviously, as a smart babyface, knowing he was about to get screwed, secured himself a title match the very next night, and then 
Face the Undertaker on this show. My God. This was a super, this was a really hot match actually. And to this day, it's, well, it's never going to change, is it? It's the highest rated segment in the history of Raw. So don't let people like Vince Russo and other revisionist history tell you that the Rock and Mankind, this is your life, was the highest rated segment in the history of Raw. That is a lie. The real answer is this Austin Undertaker match at the end of this show, which I believe drew about 10 million viewers, which is just ridiculous. And then number one, come on. I'm, I'm sure you know, you know exactly what I'm going to say here. Rock Mankind defeating The Rock January 4th, 1999, to become the World Wrestling Federation champion. Just, oh God, yeah, this, this is just an iconic moment, isn't it really? And my God. That was 24 years ago. So years before Daniel Bryan was the underdog becoming the champion, Mick Foley was that guy. I mean, Mick, Mick Foley was never supposed to be the World Wrestling Federation champion. I mean, that, that was just kind of upset that Mick Foley becoming the champion was never really on the card. But it happened. Foley got over as hell in, in one of the most memorable Raw main events of all time. And Foley, Mankind, defeats The Rock to become the world champion. It was just a brilliant moment, wasn't it? It was just a wonderful, wonderful moment. Um, so, what are your thoughts on the infamous billionaire Ted Skitzy aired in 1996? Ugh. At first, it was kind of amusing, but the more they got it, it was just Vince being petty and spiteful, really, wasn't it? I mean, yeah, that's pretty much what it was. I mean, because some of them started out like as innocently as joking and all that, but if you actually go back and watch all of them, it just kind of gets a bit more sinister and a bit more sinister. And it shows where Vince's mindset was at the time. I mean, Vince, he wasn't getting beat just yet. I mean, Nitro hadn't pulled ahead in the ratings totally yet. But WCW was nipping at his heels. And obviously later in the year would overtake him and beat him for a couple of years. And Vince didn't like that. So Vince had these parody uh, skits of Ted Turner as billionaire Ted. Um, Hooks and portraying Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, and Mean Gene. Well, Hogan and Savage is like geriatric old wrestlers, which is bitterly ironic looking back now because Hogan and Savage were in the mid 40s at the time and they just looked like what's considered old then and what's considered old now. That, that was just shitting on people that made you a lot of money. That was just really like, ugh, that's just a low blow. Um, and do you know what? what I, tell you what I hated the most is what a hypocrite Vince was in this period. So, do we, granted, do we see we had done some stuff to compete with him? But Vince had done way worse to other people in the three territory days. I mean, look at all the horrible shit Vince pulled in the 80s with various promotions. Um, taking people's TV slots, stealing the talent and all that. Um, threatening to... Uh, Threatening cable companies to pull pay-per-views. Uh, now, now Vince was uh, experiencing some of the same stuff happening to him. He crowd filed. It was just like, you hypocrite. How dare you? How dare you try to paint yourself as a victim in this case? Like, you motherfucker. How, how, how can you do that? It was just, you know. Um, so, yeah. It was just, yeah. It was just, I just, it was just not. They didn't need to do that. It was just, I felt like Vince was being, being vindictive and petty and spiteful yeah not a lot has changed in the last 27 years clearly on that front has it but yeah i just did i didn't like it now this is a good question so i'm going to try my best to go with it if you could change the direction slash outcome of five storylines what would they be and what would you do two examples i want to mention that i'll be taking off the table because they're pretty obvious are the higher power angle in 1999 and the Kane Triple H Katie Vick angle in 2002. Well, good, because the Katie Vick solution is obvious. Don't fucking do it. Um, so, fine. So, for this one, I'm also going to eliminate the invasion angle because I just feel like I could literally go on for like 20, 30, 40 minutes explaining all the things that were wrong with that invasion angle. And I just don't want to take up too much time on the video. Um, another one, I would. The one I thought about and I excluded, um, and I'm in the higher power ones. I'm glad you said I shouldn't do that as well because the thing is, he sort of booked himself in the corner that it has to be Vince. Now I know a lot of people say it should have been Jake Roberts, and on paper that sounds wonderful, but this was Jake Roberts in 1999. 
Jake Roberts was an absolute mess at the time. Just think this was a few months before Heroes of Wrestling. So there's no way that version of Jake Roberts was going to be anything good in the WWF in 1999. So another angle I'm going to take off the table is the Hornswoggle being revealed as Vincent Mann's son in 2007. Because the solution was there. It was supporting Mr. Kennedy, but Mr. Kennedy got suspended. So... I sort of give WWE the benefit of the doubt on this one. They had a better solution. They just couldn't do it. Um, so, two from the same era. I mean, I'm, I'm, I bet you know which one I'm going to say. I think the big one for me is uh, the Triple H, Kurt Angle, Stephanie McMahon, Love Triangle storyline in 2000. Never in my life have I seen a storyline with better build-up and then a shitty payoff. So, for months and months, they built their... They built up the relationship between Kurt Angle and Stephanie McMahon. Um, Kurt Angle and Stephanie McMahon got closer and closer and closer. And over the summer, this storyline exploded. Um, and that obviously led uh, Kurt kissing Stephanie on the SmackDown before SummerSlam. And that, and that was a big part of selling the SummerSlam main event. And that, that little angle continued. And then it was going to culminate at Unforgiven. Kurt Angle versus Triple H. And this is where Stephanie was going to finally turn on Triple H right because Triple H was actually starting to get fair pretty over as a baby face and um, this is where St uh, Stephanie's going to turn on Triple H and go with Kurt Angle dump Triple H and go out with Kurt Angle right wrong so this I, well I don't I don't really, really know what truly happened but this was definitely the time when Stephanie took over the creative writing and of, I, I believe this is around the time Triple H and Stephanie became a couple in real life. Because I, I think no one's really totally sure when the Triple H-Stephanie relationship truly started. Um, only Triple H and Stephanie know, and they're not going to speak about it, are they? Um, so this, I, but I, I'm pretty sure at this point they were a couple in real life, or at least... Or at least they were banging each other behind the partner's back. Who knows? Um, so what we think happened is Triple H got in Stephanie's ear, cancelled cancelled the thing, uh, and then Stephanie just kicked her angle of the balls and went back to Triple H. Triple H, and then the whole romant the whole romantic part of the Kurt Angle Stephanie relationship was dropped after that. And God, such a missed opportunity. I mean. I know it was 22 years ago or whatever, but it just still drives me nuts that they fucked this angle up so much. Honestly, go back and watch some of those 2000 shows. The build-up of that angle was great. Absolutely great. But then the payoff just really, really sucked ass, didn't it? Ugh. She did not like it. And then, by the same token, the same era, and I kind of pinpoint this period when the WWF started noticeably going downhill creatively, was... Rikishi, the man that ran down Stone Cold Steve Austin. This was another one. The build-up to this was... The build-up to this was amazing. I mean, the intrigue. If you were a fan watching at the time, you were so excited to see who the person was to run, run over Stone Cold Steve Austin. Because when Austin came... God, just the build-up of that was freaking great. And then we get the reveal. Rikishi. And it was just like... Huh? Rikishi? Really? That's kind of... It wasn't, the, the, the reaction wasn't really anger or anything like that. It was just like, really? This is a payoff? Rikishi? It was just a really big flop. And it just never worked for so many reasons. Um, so what would I do? So basically... So when I was younger, I, I, I thought it should be The Rock. But now I've got old and I thought about it and I realised... It'd be kind of stupid, really, wouldn't it, to turn the rock heel at that point when he was at the height of his popularity. So I think it should have just been Triple H all along. No, it should have, yeah, the reveal should have been. Because that because they, they did kind of salvage the angle later on when the Rikishi thing flopped and um, seeing that uh, uh, Rikishi was an accomplice of someone else and that per Triple H was a real mastermind behind it and Triple H turned back heel there. Uh, Right before Survivor Series that year. So it should have just been Triple H from the start. And it, if, if Triple H was revealed to be the guy from the beginning. Then the whole thing wouldn't have flopped as hard as it did. Now next one. I'm going to go on a ruthless aggression territory now. And that is Randy Orton. Uh, 
being kicked out of Evolution the night after SummerSlam. Oh, this was a flop. This was a big, big flop. So what we knew at the time, because we were all in, we, if we were on the IWC at the time, it was well known the, the long-term plan to WrestleMania 21. It was Randy Orton versus Triple H. Uh, Randy Orton was going to be kicked out of Evolution, turned babyface. It was going to be a big thing. However, WWE just completely jumped the gun here. Um, so really out of nowhere, Randy Orton went from Intercontinental Champion in July to become the youngest World Heavyweight Champion in August when he beat Chris Benoit for the World Heavyweight title. And then it was like, right, so if Orton's won the title now, how the hell are you going to get the Triple H versus Randy Orton at WrestleMania? How, the hell, how are you going to keep this hot for uh, eight months? Well... WWE's idea was apparently to have Randy Orton turn babyface the very next night. Honestly, I feel like this moment is so overrated. I really do. So, admittedly, the actual moment of uh, Triple H doing the thumbs down and then the big beat down was actually good. But if you look at it properly, what the hell was this? Why did they do this? Ugh. And then, to top it all off, right... Okay, so Randy Orton's now a babyface world heavyweight champion. So you've you've blown your load on this. You've um you've done this turn way too early. But are we gonna try and salvage this and make it the best it can? Well no, apparently not, because Triple H has beat Orton for the World Heavyweight title a month later, unforgiven us like What? Ha this was terrible and then so of course after that Orton flopped as a babyface, because why wouldn't he? Because the, the, the booking was terrible and that pivoted Batista so it's really a simple solution really of how I would change it I think you pretty much do everything you did with Batista and do it with on because Batista turning on Triple H was done absolutely perfectly so I would say for this one you could have Orton lose a close match to Benoit Triple H can win the title from Chris Benoit at Unforgiven and then, yeah, you, after that, you just do pretty much do what you did with Batista. And that is, have Randy Orton slowly get sick and tired of being the lackey in Evolution and all that. And so if, if you put, if you kept, if you did this slowly and did what you did with Batista, I think it would have worked just as well with Orton, but that didn't happen. Now, number five, I mean, no, there's number four, sorry. This is a fairly obvious one. The Nexus angle in 2010, I mean, ugh. It actually pains me how great that initial angle was and then what happened. And it's a simple solution, really. Uh, Nexus Nexus win. Nexus win the SummerSlam match. I mean, come on. I mean, the ang I, mean I know the angle went on longer after SummerSlam, but they were, they were essentially cut off the knees at that point when Cena beat them. And, and the manner he beat them as well was just as bad as winning itself. So I think it's really simple. Nexus win the big match. John Cena goes to months trying to get revenge on the Nexus and all that. Um, uh, yeah, so I think it's as simple as that. Um, I think I think you can still do the Cena being a reluctant member of Nexus angle because that wasn't too bad. Um, but don't have the fire and stipulation because that was terrible. And I think it's simple really. Instead of uh, Orton and Barrett, it eventually leads to Cena versus Barrett in a match where Cena has to be free for the Nexus, then, C then Cena can win. Cena can win in the end, that's fine, no issue with that really, it's just the fact that Cena won the first battle and just ruined this potentially awesome faction. And then the last one, was well, not recent, but it was from like six, seven years ago, and that Shane McMahon coming, right, you, you, probably, you probably know what I want to say, you know, so Shane McMahon coming back to WWE to face The Undertaker at WrestleMania 32, Hell in a Cell, so the simple change is just personnel, Shane McMahon coming back to WWE to try to get control of Raw wasn't a bad storyline in itself, but it just would have made so much more sense if it was Triple H in there instead of The Undertaker, because... Having the Undertaker be the opponent was just, it didn't, it was kind of confusing. It had like more questions than answers. Why was the Undertaker fighting for Vince and all that? And where if it was Triple H, it would have been much more simple. Triple H had, had it all to lose as well because he was married to the McMahon family. And he had, he had it all to lose by Shane gaining control of Raw and potentially WWE. So 
Triple H was going to defend Shane against Vince and all that. I just feel like, yeah, if it was Triple H, yeah, the storyline would have been much more better. And then, make, make more of the lockbox. It still annoys me at this day that Shane had this lockbox on Vince and then it just got dropped and never spoke about it again. What? So, yeah, make more of that lockbox. I mean, no, I'm not even going to go, I'm not even going to joke about NDAs and all that. It's a bit raw at the moment. But, yeah, so, I think it's as simple as that. Change the personnel, Triple H in The Undertaker's place, then you've got a much more coherent storyline. That was probably one of the best questions in the whole Q&A, to be fair. Um, right, okay. Right, top five and least favourite five. Five things, storyline, feud, promos, angles, etc. about Raw 1997. With such a major... Ah, try again. Such a major wave of change occurring that year in the tradition transitional period between the attitude into the attitude here between WrestleMania 13 and Vince's speech in December. Um, do you think these things would represent what? Right. You think these things best represent what the company area would bring? So, far as least, there's not that many bad things in that thing, really. So I'm just going to quickly list them off. Gang Wars, that was a poor storyline. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm specifically going to go with that period from WrestleMania 13 up until December for this, to be fair. So... Yeah, so I'm going to go, Gang Wars was probably the worst. The Truth Commission was a terrible act. Um, can't remember that many of that terrible, terrible promos or matches, really. I mean, I'm sure there was some crappy matches on Raw during that time, but I can't remember them. So, top five favourite things. I mean, obviously, the night after WrestleMania. So, we'll, we'll go, we'll not say in any particular order, but... Um, so Brett turning hit so the whole just the whole Heart Foundation thing in general really but it really stemmed from the night after WrestleMania 13 where after months and months Brett finally lays it all the line plays all of his cards on the table that that big heel turn after WrestleMania was just great absolutely loved it awesome stuff and then I'll say another pick would be the Jim Ross interview Mick Foley series and um, the JR interview on Mankind. That was that went from about about four week segment. That it was it was one of the first kind of half shoot half kayfabe um, interview sort of thing. So JR did a similar thing with Dustin Rhodes earlier in the year, and that was good. But this Mankind one was absolutely amazing because for the first time, really, we got the. Here, the real Mick Foley's backstory on television and all that. And it just added so many layers to the Mankind character. And turned Mankind babyface. Oh, on, I'm, I'm pretty sure you could YouTube all these promos if you wanted to. But honestly, the interviews were awesome. And it's just, why can't WWE do something like that today? Pick a wrestler with an interested backstory and just tell the story. But they could easily do something like that today and get... Get someone who doesn't have really a good character over more. Um, yeah, I just think that'd be great. Um, then I guess the, the whole build-up to the reveal of Kane being alive. So, oh my God. The, the Undertaker Kane saga really goes all the way back to just after WrestleMania 13. Where Paul Undertaker was a WF champion. And Paul Bearer tried to take the Undertaker back. Uh, the Undertaker said no. And then at the Revenge of the Taker pay-per-view... Undertaker burned Paul Bearer's face and then Paul Bearer played his ultimate trump card. He had a secret on The Undertaker. A secret that Undertaker desperately did not want to get out. A secret that could potentially ruin The Undertaker if the creatures of the night knew about it. And that forced Undertaker to reluctantly upset Paul Bearer and be Paul uh, uh, Undertaker under, uh, Paul Bearer was managing The Undertaker again. And um, Eventually, this all blew up. And then the big reveal was that um, when he was a kid, the Undertaker started. There was a fire at the full funeral home, which killed both killed both the Undertaker's parents and his younger brother Kane. So that is why the Undertaker didn't want it to come out. And then, then what happened was there was an even bigger reveal that Kane had in fact survived the fire. And that infamous, he's alive. Kane is alive, Undertaker! 
Your brother Kane is coming! So you know that one. Well, that was uh, right after King of the Ring, I believe. And then you had, like, all this time, like, three or four months to build up to Kane debuting. Oh, brilliant stuff. Brilliant stuff. I mean, and then obviously just the general rise of Stone Cold. I mean, that was just, ugh. Pretty much everything Stone Cold did in that period was absolutely golden. I mean, a couple of standout, him and Shawn Michaels beating Davey and Owen for the tag titles. And Stunner and Vince for the first time and all that. Wow. And then the general rise of DX. I mean, DX's rise started in the summer of 1997 and just blew up. I mean, so I can't really pinpoint a particular segment for that. Just the whole thing in general, the whole angle. I mean, this was just a wonderful time period, wasn't it? A wonderful time period. There we go. Uh, when WWE did the draft in 2005 and had Batista go to SmackDown and John Cena go to Raw, had they not done the change and kept them on the shows they were most known for at the time, what the dynamic of the treachery, that's a big word, of the company and both guys have been in those positions between 05 and 10? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because... Cena going to Raw was pretty much the start of Cena becoming the face of WWE. Because honestly, I believe in 2005, especially in the early stages, Batista was probably a bigger star than Cena. And then Cena going to Raw. So in that sense, a complete... For, for me, that spelled out that WWE saw Cena as the new potential face of the company. So... But the thing is, I, I think the difference. I think uh, Batista didn't have quite have the same charisma Cena had, and Cena was like ten years younger than Batista, so it made sense for them to do that. Only thing is, if, if this, I think it was actually great at switching because what did both guys have in store after after the summer of two thousand five? Really, I mean, on SmackDown, who did Cena really have to feud with that he hadn't feuded with before? Batista the same. So who did Batista have to feud with on Raw, really? I mean, there was no one else really, was he, to be fair? Um, so, yeah, I just... Yeah, I think that, that was really the big change. Uh, it just really spelled out the Cena was going to be the guy, you know? There we go. Next set of questions. Uh, De Gren's Devil. I probably said your name wrong, but that is what it is. So what are the best slash worst Raw episodes of all time? Um, so it's really, really hard to say what is the absolute worst episode of Raw of all time because there's so many bad ones in like in the last five years. Way especially like I would say 2017, 2018, 2019 was a particular just a horrible period, and there's no really one Raw episode that stands out as being the absolute worst. So I don't really know what the absolute worst episode of Raw is, but. I will just pinpoint that period in 2017, 2018. When, the, when Raw got so bad, the McMahons had to publicly apologise for it and promise to change things, and they never changed things. But, you know, so I don't know what the absolute worst episode of Raw is. Best one, though, uh, when I go back to one I said before, the night after WrestleMania 14, that is, for me, the best ever episode of Raw because so much stuff happened on that show. The Os McMahon feud kicked into high gear with Austin Stunner and Vince again then um, yeah the rock finally the nation finally turn on Farouk uh, picking Farouk out of the nation and the rock taken up to become the new leader of the nation the new DX was formed by this night with X-Pac returning to the WWF and cutting that big promo on Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan and that led to the new age outlaws joining DX later on the night after the main event of um then regain the tag team titles from between Cactus Jack and Terry Funk. Um, the Undertaker Kane feud continued on this show. The Sable vs. Luna feud continued on this show. This was just a mega, mega eventful Raw. There we go. As I'm... As a German, I'm obliged to ask, what are your thoughts on the Raw from Berlin? And especially the Owen Bulldog match. So, last part of the question first. Owen and Bulldog... For me, it's the greatest match ever in the history of Raw. Wow. I love this match. This match, oh, what a match. What a beautiful wrestler match it really was. I mean, if you haven't seen this match, stop what you're doing, pause the video, or go check this match out. Honestly, I honestly feel like this is the best match in the history of Raw. 
one of the best uh, three television matches in pro wrestling history period this was a classic this was an absolute classic between two great technical wrestlers just having a, a wonderful wrestler match i mean just god i love that match now as far as the actual show and i've reviewed this show actually and um, i've reviewed this show before so the actual content of the show was fine like there was nothing wrong with what was actually on the show i mean as a wrestling show, it was very decent. I mean, you had a good Bret and Triple H match on that show. I think you had Rocky Maivia versus Vader on that show. Sid versus Mankind. But the problem was, this was supposed to be a house show, which at some point in time became a raw taping. Um, so, so originally, this wasn't supposed to be a raw taping, but they taped raw there as well. But the problem was, production-wise, it looked, it looked exactly what it was a house show and that was just that was just a terrible look for tv i mean that it was very dimly lit the arena wasn't very great it just the product production overall just looked really bad especially considering at the time they were competing with the cutting edge production of wcw nitro uh, and it was taped as well so you didn't have the live aspect to it so it just visually looked bad for tv um it just turned a lot of people off. And I imagine someone watching Raw that night thought, you know, I'm just going to watch Nitro. Switch over to Nitro instead because that actually... So, yeah, they, it shouldn't, they shouldn't have done it for TV because or if they did do it, they should have planned it in advance and actually had the proper Raw set and the proper reduction team and all that. And it just would have looked so much better. But that was a problem, really. Just the way it looked. It looked bad for TV. How many times do you think about quitting Raw on a week-to-week -week basis before you did? So it just kind of happened. It just kind of happened over time. A combination of just not liking the product as much, and then just becoming an adult and having other things to do in your life and all that. Um, so I would say. So I probably stopped watching week to week about 2007ish. So I, no, no, I, I'll go back and probably decline, probably start around late 2003 because I'd, uh, I'd left school and all that by that point. And then, you know what it is when you, when you get to 16, 17, 18, you prioritise like having a good time, going out with your friends and all that and getting up to getting up the stuff you probably shouldn't have getting up to. So you're not home every week to watch. You're not home to watch Raw every single week and all that. So... Say the start of it was probably 2003. I still watched more sweets in 2004. Uh, I probably, I probably watched more sweets in 2005 as well. And then even 2006, I was still kind of in. But by 2007, yeah, that was, yeah. So it was kind of that. So, so obviously, so I. So, so I was definitely I was thinking about it since at least late 2003 and then fully got out of watching week to week in 2007 and there has been times where I've went back and watched but these days I probably watch Smackdown a lot more than I watch Raw uh, because of it's two hours and all that and it's just easier and um, but yeah so I'll probably pinpoint like late 2003 into 2004 is when I started to think about quit watching week to week and pinpoint about 2007 when I actually did it. There we go. Thoughts on a. Uh, thoughts on your. What are your thoughts on the Raw Roulette? And should it be brought back for the holidays? So yeah, I thought Raw Roulette was great. And they had. The ones I remember is the 2002 one, which had the, the TLC4 match, and they did it again in 2003. They've probably done it since then, but I can't remember. And yeah, I just think it's a neat little concept. I mean, just give the show a gimmick and uh, make the show a little bit different. And yeah, I think they absolutely should bring it back. Not necessarily for the holidays, just whenever they go back to Las Vegas. So it doesn't have to be in during the holiday time. It could be literally any time of the year they could do it. And um, yeah, if say Raw came to Vegas next week, they could do a Raw Roulette next week and it would work. So yeah, I'd, I'd be all for that. I mean, thought Raw in 2002 was pretty crap, but 
that I think it's October seventh, two thousand two. That Raw Roulette episode was actually a really great episode, and then the following year, it was pretty good as well. And like I say, it probably has happened since then, but I don't particularly remember it. And um, so, what are some of your least favorite Raw segments? Be a promo, match, or angle? So I'll just go through a few. I mean, uh, match wise, I can't really think of many. I guess Booker and Bagwell in the WCW match in 2001 was pretty awful. But I've seen that match back since then. And it wasn't the absolute duddest made out. It was a bad match, yeah. But not like the worst match ever or anything stupid like that. So, few segments really. Um, oh, God. Right. Do I even need to elaborate on this? Triple H in a cane mask pretending to shag a dead body in a morgue. Do I need to really explain that one? I don't think I do, really. It's pretty much that. Triple H was pretending to be Kane, having sex with a mannequin that was, that was pretending was a dead body in a morgue. I can't really say any more about it than that, can I really? Good God. Um, and probably the one that apps, maybe the worst segment I ever on Raw and I can't remember exactly which Raw it was it was January of 1999 though where Terry Runnels faked having a miscarriage it's like no no because Terry Runnels was pretending to be pregnant after he was going out of Val Venus and we didn't know who the baby's dad was then for some reason Terry and Jacqueline's PMS were aligned with D'Lo Brown and Terry was having an argument with D'Lo Brown and she fell off the apron and she had a wink wink miscarriage. That's just not why. That's just so horrible. I mean, everyone's. If. if Everyone knows someone who's had a miscarriage. You know what I mean? It happens all the time. And it's just. Why does wrestling need to go there and remind fans of all these horrible things? Just. Oh. Yeah, just terrible, terrible. Um, so the Vincent Trish. Wait. Where Vincent had Trish barking like a dog and stripping down, and I believe that was March of 2001. Oh God, that was bad. That was just that was just a horrible segment. It really was horrible, horrible segment. Now this this I'm gonna leave two out because I'm asked specifically about those later on in the video. But the ones from 2007, ones from 2018. No, sorry, 2017, 2018. Sorry. So we'll ignore those ones for now. We'll come back to a couple later on. Um, the, oh, what was it? Trump and all, done the, the parody Trump versus Rose Joe Donald match in 2007. That one just shit the bed. And that was strictly booked for Vince's own entertainment. The only person that really wanted to see that on TV was Vince. And obviously Vince is a boss, so Vince get, gets what he wants. Oh, oh. One that I think was... See, I'm in two minds about this next one. Because it was terrible, but it was also kind of hilarious how bad it was, if that makes sense. So do you remember, <laughs> do you remember the John Cena, This Is Your Life segment in 2011? So Mick Foley come back to WWE and they basically did a parody segment of the rock, the rock and Mankind, This Is Your Life thing in 1999. And my God, it was. Just... See, I'm not. Even, I'm not sure if it was terrible or it was so bad it was awesome sort of thing. But good God, it was terrible, absolutely terrible segment. That's about. There's, there's obviously a lot more, but those are the ones that I can think of now. Next set of questions from Ax Gazi. How did you feel? That should be feel when you saw May Young's sarcastic quotation marks son at Raw One Thousand. Are you trying to tell me that wasn't really May Young's son? Um, but okay, so like to give a serious answer, it was kind of amusing. Honestly, it was a harmless enough joke. It was honestly up, no harm done really. It was silly, of course it was silly, but it was sort of funny. But I've got a few questions about this. Right, number one, I didn't know that if you. So what is this per? Is he a hand slash human hybrid person? So if if you're born a hand, do you then become a kind of human person? Okay, no number question number two. We're well, not a question, but more of an observation, really. Th this is certainly the most um, mo this is the oldest looking twelve year old I've ever seen in my life. So if you think about it, this hand, 
human hybrid, whatever the hell it is, was born in 2000, right? So this was 2012, so this hand hybrid person would be 12 years old. Well, he, he looked like a fully grown adult to me, so what is the question here? If you're born a hand, do you age twice as fast? Is it like animal years where where you, where you age and where you age uh, we age much faster so if you tw if so if you're born a hand by the time you're 12 are you really 25 which is what this person appeared to look and number two what i thought was very interesting this is a white guy right so so is mark henry not the father of this child then because if mark henry was the father of this hand man child thing the hand the hand man child thing would be brown right well this was white, so May Young's white, so that leaves a question. Who was May Young cheating on Mark Henry with behind her back to create this hand man person? Gerald Briscoe, perhaps. Maybe, N not Patterson, obviously, that, that'd be silly. Would, did, would he, did you uh, get slipped the big Val Borsky? Is Val Venus the father? Maybe Vince is the father of this. Maybe she was sleeping with Vince or Shane or... Who else was on the roster? Maybe maybe Crash Holly. Maybe Bradshaw, the APA. Who knows? So there you go. Now that's a big mystery. Who is the real father of May Young's hand? It's Because it can't be Mark Henry, can it? If you logically think about it. <laughs> because he's white. And Mark Henry's a black guy. So the baby would be brown. Um, so okay. So all right. Okay. So moving on from that one. I just thought I'd have a laugh at that one. Uh, favorite segment of each year so i'm going to be trying to be quick as possible because this is a really long answer and i don't really want to go on like 30 40 minutes to do the same answer so i'm just going to try and quick find my way around them best i can so 1993 so also we're not going to include this year because it's like what three weeks old four weeks old so 1993 one two three kid beating razor ramon i mean at the time, that was just such a shocking moment because what television was, you saw it all the time. Uh, star faces the jobber guy. Um, the star gets all of his big moves in, makes short work of the young local talent, beats him in about two minutes, and that's it. That's the formula. That's what happens. Not on this case, though. One, two, three kid shocks the world. He was actually called the kid in this match. Hits a moonsault, pins a razor Ramon, shocks the world. I mean... God, that was just an awesome moment. And the AEW has even tried to recently recreate that of Chris Jericho and... Anne, was it Action... Is that his name? Action Andretti. So AEW tried to do the same thing a few weeks ago, didn't they? So even now, this this moment is hugely influential because they keep trying to recreate it. Now, 1994, I've come up with nothing. Now, don't worry. This is the only year of... This is the only year of the 30 that's blank. It's just simple. I can't really think of any particular moment that stands out. Because I think what people don't realise is before the Monday Night War, Superstars was probably still the A show and Raw was just another show. It wasn't the big show it is now. So in 1994, nothing that interesting really happened. So I moved on to 1995. I've gone with Shawn Michaels' collapse the night after Survivor Series. That was an awesome angle. So... It was coming back from the Shawn Michaels getting getting beat up in Syracuse, which, good God. I'd love to break that down, break down that lies one day. WWE claimed it was up to six or nine Marines. The truth is, Shawn Michaels got beat up by one person. Don't kid yourself. So, the uh, teaser Shawn Michaels had a big concussion, and then he came back a Survivor Series. Then the night after Survivor Series, he was wrestling Owen Hart. Then Shawn Michaels collapses in the ring. And it just goes to dead air. Everything just stops. Everyone, all the medics not dive in the ring. They don't have the commentators trying to talk over it. So they saw this as being a real thing. And as a fan at the time, it was super believable. You could really believe that Shawn Michaels was really fucked up. It was a great segment. Now, 1996 this is an interesting answer, I feel. Because I think most people would have expected me to go of the Austin uh, Brian Pillman gun angle of 1996. Well, that has that hasn't aged well. Looking back now, if you look at that from 2023 eyes, 
that angle just has not aged very well at all. I mean, it was great at the time, but not something I'd really look back on fondly now. Um, but I've gone for Vader attacking Gorilla Monsoon the night after the Royal Rumble. Because the thing is, kind of like, if you were a kid watching wrestling in the 90s, Gorilla Monsoon was sort of like a grandfather figure to you. So, in a way, because I, as a fan, I never knew Gorilla Monsoon as a wrestler, obviously. Because um, it was way before my time. So I just knew Gorilla Monzo as a commentator guy and then the interim president of the WWF. Um, but obviously I knew Gorilla was a wrestler because he references several times. So I'd never ever seen Gorilla Monzo in a physical angle. So it was the night after Vader had beaten Savio Vega. Vader was trying to continue to beat down Gorilla Monzo and Vader get into a big argument. Vader shows Monzo and Monzo actually fires back off a couple of chops. And then Vader just brutally beats down Gorilla Monsoon, hits him with a couple of Vader bombs. It was a really shocking angle, actually, at the time. Because it was sort of like someone beating up your granddad. I mean, I was so outraged at the time when Vader did that. And it got Vader's WWF career off to an awesome start. And it's just sort of a shame it never really took off after that. Um, but yeah, that was a great angle. So... 1997 I've sort of bended the rules a little bit to include two but they're intertwined of each other so sort of makes sense um but don't, this is the only time I've got two moments for one year and that's first off 1997 the whole Bret Hart snapping angle at the end of that Sid Cage match where where he shows Vince on his ass tells him the frustrated isn't the goddamn word for this is bullshit goes in that huge rant and that leads to the next week, the night after WrestleMania 13, when Brett cuts that awesome promo outlining everything that happened to him over the last few weeks, months. And then cements his uh, heel turn by turning on the American fans. The whole wrestling fans coast to coast and kiss my ass. So I've gone for those two because they kind of interwine with each other. But God, yeah, awesome stuff. Then 1998. The Tyson and Austin confrontation, wow. I'll say, if you have to push me, that is my favourite wrestling moment of all time. Just, it's hard to imagine what it was like at the time, what a star Mike Tyson was. And now he is Tyson in a WWF ring, and Stone Cold's coming out to confront Mike Tyson, and then they get into a big shoving match? Wow. You were sold on seeing Tyson in a WWF after that, believe me. That was a huge, huge moment. Then 1999, go back to something I said before. Mankind win the WWF title on January the 4th, 99 Raw. Just such an iconic moment. Ah, such an iconic moment. Then 2000, where Chris Jericho kind of wins the WWF title. So, so Jericho... So was Jericho and Triple H, right? They had a match on Raw. It became a title match. Then Chris Jericho pins Triple H with Earl Hebner delivering a fast count. So I was like, what? Because ironically enough, the best two TV match moments of that year happened on SmackDown. And that's uh, Mankind morphing back into Cactus Jack and Stone Cold destroying DX's bus. Those both happened on SmackDown. But this one, wow. This was a shocking moment. And the fans went absolutely crazy for Jericho. But that, that obviously got overturned later on in the show where Jericho was forced to hand the Dewey title back. But God, that was just so exciting. It really was. 2001, I've gone for the the Raw before the invasion where Stone Cold joined in the fight. So the previous SmackDown, Vince had want, said he wanted the old Stone Cold back to come back the Alliance. Austin said no. This was a Raw where Austin was sulking in the bar all night long. Then we had all these awesome speeches uh, building up the invasion. Then there was then Austin finally at one point, it was after Freddie Blassie's inspiring speech, Austin got into, left the bar, got in his car, apparently drove there, which I'm thinking, hold on, this is not drink driving. But anyway, ignore that minor, in minor part. And um, so Austin's going back to the arena. Then there's a huge brawl, WWF and WCW, ECW guys. The Alliance guys are getting the better of the WWF. Stone Cold shows up in the nick of time. And then that pop Austin got, my God. That was a goosebump level pop, that one, right? When Austin came back and started whipping all the WCW guys' ass. And for me, that's 
that that makes the heel with Austin turn to go in the alliance even more stupid because the Sturia fans had outlined what they wanted. They wanted Stone Cold Steve Austin to be the Stone Cold Steve Austin they know and love. They didn't want Austin as a heel, but no, they turned the back heel anyway. But God, that was an awesome moment. 2002, I'll go with Hulk Hogan the night after WrestleMania. I mean, I thought about cheating again and doing doing a combo of the rock challenging hogan after no way out and then this one but i decided not to do that i feel like i i bent the rules enough to do the 1997 one i wasn't going to bend the rules again but god hogan the night after wrestlemania 18 oh my god how over was he how how loved was he by the fans you know that that pop was absolutely incredible it was crazy Hogan had been away from the Duref for so long and now he was back and then he was just embraced as this returning hero. I mean, Hulk Hogan's name's obviously been slung in the mud for the last few years and there's some merit to that. I mean, if anyone wants to hate Hulk Hogan, fine, I totally understand it. Um, I, no, I, I can, yeah, I, I accept that, but God, just how over Hogan was in 2002 was insane. Now, going into 2003, I've gone for... Goldberg's WWE debut. There's not that many great moments from 2003, but I think that one definitely sticks out. I mean, that was a big one. He was really, apart from Stink, the last major WCW guy to come over. Um, we were all anticipating Goldberg and WWE, and that was the night after WrestleMania 19, so great moment. 2004, I had a hard time with this one, because I couldn't think of that many great moments. So, this isn't a particularly amazing moment, but... It's the best one I could come up with, really. And that kind of Shelton Benjamin upsetting Triple H right after the draft. So I believe it was the first Raw after the 2004 draft. Shelton had been drafted at Raw and he beat Triple H. Wow. I mean, that didn't... Unfortunately, that did not lead to a main event run for Shelton Benjamin, ultimately. But what a moment it was at the time. It was a clean win as well, which... Holy crap, because this was right at the height of Triple H's reign in Terry away, where he wasn't putting over anybody right. And then he puts over Shelton Benjamin, so that's pretty damn shocking. 2005, I'm going to go with um, Batista, when Batista finally turned babyface. I believe it was the night after No Way Out 2005, I believe. Could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was. So this was like tease and tease a month. And Batista was going to make the decision, was he going to... Go to SmackDown and challenge JBL for the WWE title. Or was he going to stay on Raw and go for Triple H? So for weeks and weeks, Triple H was trying to manipulate Batista into going to SmackDown. Because he didn't want, because he knew he couldn't beat Batista. He didn't want to fight Batista at WrestleMania. So Triple H was actually being an awesome heel, really. Um, and then Batista finally played his card. He goes, Hunter, I've known I was going to do for a long time. Does the thumbs down, attacks Triple H, power bombs are at the table, declares he's staying right here on Raw, and he's going to challenge Triple H for the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania. That was an awesome storyline, honest to God. That was a great, great storyline, it really was. Now, 2006 is another one I had to kind of scrape to find something I really liked, because I couldn't really think of anything big so and this isn't really a great moment or anything but it's the best that i come up with and that's a dx parody of the commands in the summer of 2006 this wasn't an amazing next segment or anything but can you really think of much in 2006 that was better than this i can't really to be fair 2007 again same thing couldn't find anything that was really awesome and um, so I've gone for Chris Jericho's WWE return after Survivor Series. Now this wasn't a great return or anything like that. It was a good return, but it wasn't an awesome moment. But look at Raw in 2007. As far as moment-wise, what is he? Not much at all, really. 2008, I've gone for Ric Flair's, Ric Flair's retirement ceremony after WrestleMania 24. I, I thought about being petty and disqualified because it wasn't Ric Flair's retirement ultimately but then as you'll see later I've got another retirement that didn't stick and is, is, a, is a different one so that would kind of make me a hypocrite if I disqualified this one but didn't disqualify oh no sorry didn't disqualify the other one um, so 
yeah, Ric Flair's retirement ceremony, that was just pretty awesome. The way it went, it, could, it couldn't have gone better, really. 2009 is a no one I struggled with. Really struggled to find something from 2009. Um, but ultimately, I went ahead. The Kofi Kingston boom drop on Randy Orton in Madison Square Garden. I mean, granted, Kofi's 2009 push didn't stick, unfortunately. And it took them like another full 10 years after you pulled the trigger. But... When Aut when uh, Kofi and Orton had that brawl in Madison Square Garden, and Kofi K Kingston hit the boom drop off a balcony through a table, that was a great moment. Um, but yeah, like I say, there's not there's not that much of 2009 that was that I thought was really great. Uh, 2010 saw for me Bret Hart returning on the January 4th 2010 Raw. So I will objectively say the initial Nexus beatdown. So when the Nexus debuted and all that was objectively a better moment. My person, obviously, obviously I'm going to go with Brett coming back, aren't I? I just have to, really. I have to do that. Brett coming back was just such an amazing moment for me. I'd waited for so long to see that one. Then he made up with Shawn Michaels after that, which is just like, wow, that was really stunning. 2011, oh, I'll go with the pipe bomb. Not... Yeah, I, I thought about going with The Rock's return, but the same punk pipe bomb moment probably is one of the most iconic moments in Raw history. It really is. I mean, just... I don't need really to explain that in detail. I think everyone's seen that one before. It was just an amazing, amazing moment. So now we're going to 2012, and we're going to go Brock Lesnar return the night after WrestleMania 28. Great return, I mean... We were all excited to see Brock Lesnar back, ultimately, at the time, and it was a great moment. 2013, so we're going to go back to something previously, and that's Dolph Ziggler cashing in money in the bank. Almost went for Mark Henry's fake retirement uh, segment, with, uh, with the salmon jacket and all that, but I've gone with Ziggler cashing money in the bank. God, that just the, that. Just a huge moment at the time, and it's just kind of a shame that that was that's ultimately been the highlight of Ziggler's career because this was supposed to be the start of Ziggler becoming a big star, and he never had a moment like that ever again. But God, at the time, the Ziggler cashing in was just a huge moment and probably one of the most memorable post WrestleMania Raw segments of all time, really. Just great stuff. 2014, I've gone with the Daniel Bryan Occupy Raw segment. And you could also make a strong case for that segment where he was sat on top of the cage doing the yes thing and the crowd was going absolutely mental. This is when he was still in the Wyatt family. But God, that, that Occupy Raw segment where Daniel Bryan forced Triple H and Stephanie's hand into giving him the demands of giving him a first giving him a match with Triple H and then have adding the stipulation that if Bryan wins, he gets added to the main event at WrestleMania. And that was just a that was just a great segment. So 2015 and this is a, so a fairly lean one, but I've gone with uh, Kevin Owens as main roster debut. I almost went for Sting after SummerSlam 2015, uh, when he came out as yeah when he was Seth Rollins' statue sort of thing. But yeah, Kevin Owens as main roster debut. I mean Owens was the NXT champion at the time. He debuted on Raw. He laid out John Cena. It was great stuff. Then 2016, Shane McMahon's return. I mean, look, Shane McMahon kind of got annoying as fuck later on, but that initial return was awesome. Pop was great. Everyone was into it. Um, it, it, it was just, it, 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 man, they managed to keep it secret as well, which is awesome. Which was awesome. Which is very rarely happens these days, does it? Doesn't it? So that was great. Then 2017. Simply enough, Festival of Friendship. One of the best set Raw segments of all time. And in more mod, I guess, is it modern if it was six years ago? But in the last ten years at least, one of the best, absolute best segments ever in, in Raw. Just, oh, everything about it really. Just the setup, the build, the big reveal and all that. It was just golden. It was really golden. Then 2018 has got to be the SmackDown invasion of Raw, which led to Nia Jack smashing Becky Lynch's face. And that just iconic, that iconic image now of Becky Lynch with her face bloody, with her arms outstretched. That, that was just, that's a great image. This one was, there's probably the best of a, 
but there wasn't that many really. Uh, 2019, Roman Reigns returned from cancer. Um, can't remember exactly when that was, but obviously Roman Reigns had to go away in 2018 because his leukemia came back. And then he came back and, and announced his cancer was in remission. That was just... That was just such a great moment, it really was. I mean, he was just so happy that Roman Reigns got, got well and all that sort of stuff. Then 2020, night after Royal Rumble, with Edge's big return promo after coming back at the Royal Rumble. And that led to Randy Orton coming, coming out. Then Orton beating down Edge, punting him and all that, taking him out. Wow. Absolute amazing segment. 2021. So... Does this count as a moment or a match? I'm not sure. But the short long storyline where Miz was a WWE champion and he was trying desperately to avoid Bobby Lashley all this time. He tried and tried and tried to avoid it and then Lashley eventually got Miz in the ring and then Lashley became WWE champion. I thought Miz did a perfect job as a champion for two weeks to be fair. Um, it was just a, yeah, he, he did his job excellently and made Lashley look like an absolute star in the process. Then 2022, last year, I guess Cody's post-WrestleMania promo. So Cody's first promo back after returning to the night, uh, WrestleMania 20, 38, night one. Um, yeah, he cut an awesome promo, really. And it's just kind of a shame he got injured when he did in June. But he's back now and we'll, we're going we're gonna to talk about this later on in the week. But then the last question, did you remember when they brought back the anonymous GM in 2014? They thought that we had forgot it was revealed a horsewoggle. Horsewoggle, that means face pain. Face pain. I don't know. Honestly, I, do, I don't remember that, actually. But if you say it happened, it happened. I don't, don't deny it. But to answer one part of your question, they thought we, that we forgot that it was revealed to be horsewoggle. Yeah. They just wanted you to forget that. They, they didn't really care. They thought, ah, these damn wrestling fans, they won't remember. We can just do what we want. Ha, ha, ha. But no, I don't remember it, but I totally believe that it happened. So we've got one, two, three, four. We've got six more sets of questions. We're just over an hour in. So let's keep powering through, guys. We've got Anthony C for when is. Do I rank these memorable Stone Cold Raw moments from least favourite to favourite? Corporate beer bath, Stone Cold Horse Man Hosted Well. Stone Cold Man Hospital. <coughs> Stone Cold Runs Over the Rock's Car. First stunner on Vince. So, number five, you might be controversial, but the, the beer bath at number five, I think this is the most overrated moment in Raw history. I really do. This was a good moment. Very good moment. Memorable moment. But I've literally seen it being called the greatest moment in Raw history, and I'm like, no, it wasn't. No, it was fine. It was pretty good, but... The best Rome in Raw history? No. So, number four, oh my god, Stone Cold taking Vince hostage. This was right after Judgment Day, wasn't it? Vince fired Austin and Austin took revenge in typical Stone Cold fashion. It's like, whoa. Because I watched this for the watched this back like a few years, maybe four or five years ago, and I'm like, this is outrageous. No way would this air on television today. Like, not a chance. But, God, God, that was really shocking, wasn't it? There we go. So, number three, this was... The, all these segments were at least good. Austin visiting Vince in hospital. Oh, that's just so... That's just so camp and hilarious, isn't it? So, Austin beats off Vince in hospital. It's just... The more... The, the way more Vince sells it, really, more than anything, the way Vince acts on and sells it and all that, just so expertly... <laughs> When, it, when Austin's punching Vince's broken ankle and Vince is just screaming his head off, then Austin just twats him with the bedpan, like, oh, God. And then he shows the enter up, up his ass to end the segment, just, God, awesome. So, so number two, ooh. I'll say, I'll go, number two, the first stunner, and number one, run over the Rock's car for Monster Truck. Oh, God. Great, great stuff. I mean, I love that the whole night really where Rock has the mock funeral for Austin and Austin comes out in the monster truck, runs over the Rock's car. It's just this sort of thing that we don't see enough of outside the box stuff of today. There's stuff like this. It's great, great. There we go. 
What did you think of the Mysterio family receiving airtime in 2020? Oh, this just dragged on for ages, didn't it? I mean, that Rollins Mysterio family feud, how long did that last? Four or five months? More? I mean, so the stuff with Rollins and Rey Mysterio was fine, but the whole eye for an eye stuff was just really stupid. Um, so the Dominic stuff, I mean, the Dominic Rollins match at SummerSlam was great, but then Rey's wife's getting involved, and let's face it, anti Mysterio acting is not your forte, is it? Then the whole Rey Mysterio's young daughter going out with Bud. That didn't really lead to anything, really, did it? Aaliyah and Buddy Murphy. It was just kind of funny, me seeing people lose their shit over that. Because Aaliyah's 19 and she's going out with a 32-year-old man. It's like, yeah, she's grown up. It's fine. It's not illegal. Uh, Aaliyah's not a minor. Get over it. It's a wrestling storyline. But yeah, that I just don't think they had much chemistry. Like that, that was more of the problem, really. That Aaliyah and Buddy Murphy just didn't really have that much on-screen chemistry, and Aaliyah just wasn't really an interesting character at all. I mean, it's taken up until now for Dominic to finally become interesting. Um, because this I I just, I just thought Dominic was really boring as a babyface, but now he's actually pretty damn funny as a heel. But I just feel like that angle would have been so much better if it hadn't just dragged and dragged and dragged. There we go. Okay, favourite wedding on Raw. So, for me, and I know a lot of people might not agree with this one, it was the Tess Stephanie wedding of 1999 where Tess was supposed to marry Stephanie McMahon after a really silly angle where Stephanie... <laughs> Do you remember when British Bulldog chucked a bit of Stephanie's head and Stephanie had amnesia for weeks, maybe two months, and then she slowly got her memory back? <laughs> oh, God, some of the Attitude Era stuff just hasn't aged very well, has it? Um, and neither is this uh, segment, really, to be fair. So she slowly regained her memory. She's going to marry Test, but not so fast. <laughs> the wedding couldn't go ahead because Triple H had drugged Stephanie McMahon and married her in a drive through at Las Vegas. Now, that is kind of awkward now because the implied date raping, date raping stuff has not aged well. But one thing I do feel, I feel like people that really criticised that weren't around and don't understand that, no, that was actually a ruse that, uh, in storyline-wise, Stephanie wasn't really drugged. It was all a plot all along. She secretly married. She secretly wanted to marry Triple H, really, and it was all just a plot to turn on Vince and all that. So I feel like a lot of people don't understand that aspect of it. And um, but God, that was Triple H's performance when Stephanie was supposedly caught, <laughs> and he was doing Stephanie's voice to the um, to the driving priest. I'm thinking. Because this, this priest, because she's, uh, she's a marriage guidance person in Las Vegas, she's probably seen a lot of weird shit, but does it not occur to the bride literally unconscious? And it's not blatantly obvious as Triple H doing Stephanie's voice. Was it, was the, was the marriage person just, uh, to turn a blind eye to that? So, God, that was just so entertaining. It was just, it obviously it probably doesn't age too well now, but at the time watching that, that was actually an amazing twist because I think deep down people weren't really that interested in Tess and Stephanie being a married couple. And unfortunately for Tess, Tess kind of got buried in this whole thing, but what an amazing twist that was really. And the line that always gets me, and yeah, it's a bit creepy now, but when Triple H goes to Vince, I know there's one thing on your mind, Dad, not did we, but how many times did we consummate the marriage? That just, God, oh, that was just a golden line, it really was. Um, so I'm going to got to scroll back to where I was. Um, had there been a draft in 2003, which SmackDown wrestlers would you have brought over to Raw and which ones would you send to SmackDown? That's a good question because I feel like the, the rosters were pretty much spawned in 2003, so... I don't think I'd really make wholesale changes, but I'll do a couple just to simply answer the question and not give a crappy answer. So, I think RVD a SmackDown would have been pretty good. So, let's say this happened right after WrestleMania 19 or maybe in June time. So, we'll, we'll pinpoint that time period as a time to go with. So, 
Yeah, I'll say RVD because at that point, RVD was done on Raw really as a top guy. I mean, he'd been beaten by Triple H and all that, and it just wasn't going to work for him anymore. Um, so I think you could, you could have maybe had John Cena go to Raw a little bit earlier because I feel like Cena's style suited Raw a little bit more than it did SmackDown. So you could have had Cena go to Raw, Van Damme go to SmackDown. Um, because like I say, I think the rosters were pretty much cock on. Like I think the rosters were pretty much what they needed to be at the time. Maybe you could have put Hulk Hogan back on Raw. That could have worked. Um, that could have been interesting. Maybe. Um, as far as the other way, maybe Kane to SmackDown. That might you, you could have took Kane and RVD to SmackDown with you. That could have worked. Uh, the Dudleys to SmackDown because then you could have done the Dudleys versus Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin. That would have actually been a pretty good feud to be fair. Um, but then now SmackDown to Raw, I can't really think because yeah, because I, I was actually very very happy with the 2003 rosters. I feel like they were they were, they were very well balanced to be fair. Um, but they, those are I'll just give you a few just to not give a shitty answer really. Um, Prior to Raw going to three hours in 2012 with Raw 1000, there'd already been several three hour shows for certain milestones, and I think a couple of draft shows were also three hours. Do you think before Raw going to apparently went three hours, the importance of a three hour show diminished? But yeah, because they did it at least two or three times a year. Um, if we'd done it once a year or twice a year, maybe it would have been a lot better. But yeah, like, because I think going into 2012. Three hour roars were coming a lot more common. Being, and yeah, it was just kind of hurt, really, didn't it? So yeah, I would agree with what he's saying there. Then we got um Right, so hang on, I'm gonna have to sort I'm gonna have to sort this out. Right, so Lonely Fanboy 48. Do you think Raw should have at least at least lost during his battles against SmackDown and Survivor Series 21 to 2016 and 21. I'm talking about the amount of wins compared to SmackDown. So let's look at it really. So 2016, you had Raw win three. Yeah, so there was five. There was five battles and Raw won three of them. So Raw won the women's tag. The women's tag match. They won the the tag team Survivor Series match. And Brian Kendrick beat Kalisto, which I guess counted because. He was a raw guy. Then SmackDown won the big Survivor Series match, and the Miz beat Sami Zayn. So I had no problem with that one really. That that's fine. I got no issues there at all. That made sense to me. Um, then we got 2017. So what what happened in 2017? So I'm not I'm not, I'm not including pre-show by the way. So Raw Shield beat the New Day. That's one. Raw won again. Ah, actually, yeah, so Raw won 4-3 again, which, think though, Raw was the top brand at the time, so the Shield won their match, the the, the Raw women's won, Brock and Brock Lesnar defeat, ah, no, actually, yeah, Brock Lesnar defeated AJ Styles and Raw won the big Survivor Series match at the end, so that was 4-3, and that was stuck with, uh, with, Baron Corbin beating The Miz for SmackDown. The Usos beating the Raw Tag Team Champions in Sheamus and Zaro. And Charlotte beating Alexa Bliss. So again, I have no problem with that one either. Raw won, but not by a landslide. Now, I want to say it's the next one. Is this the one where... So 2018, this is the one where Raw clean sweeped, isn't it? So let's have a look. Result. Yeah, so okay, this is the one I have a problem with. I don't have a problem with Raw winning overall, but Raw won literally every match on this show. So the Raw women's won. Rollins beat Nakamura. AOP beat The Bar. And then Raw won that match. Then Ronda Rousey and Brock Lesnar won their, their match. That's the one I have a problem with. That's the, that's the only one I really have a big issue with because that just pretty much buried SmackDown. That was, that was terrible. That was absolutely awful. Um, so 2019, that, that was that was the NXT one, wasn't it? So I'm not going to count that one because that because remember at the time NXT was going up against AEW, and that was all about trying to get NXT over. So that one's fine. Um, 
then 2020. So how does that one go? Cause that, so the so raw so those six matches raw one one two. Ah, that was actually three three that so that that was actually a tie raw if you but if you count the yeah so raw won the survivor series match then lashley defeated sammy Zayn. raw won the women's match and then smackdown won the three profits defeating the new day sasha banks to beat Asuka and roman reigns beat drew matches that was actually three three so that was that was what it was i suppose and then what happened 2021 let's have a look which is so when obviously again not count pre-show so raw won yeah so raw won four wait one was a battle royal so but yeah raw sweep smackdown again that that was a bit strange now coming in 2021 where smackdown's a big show on fox so i found that one was a bit strange so Becky beat Charlotte. The men won the Survivor Series match. RK Bro beat the Usos. The Raw Women's won the match. And the only SmackDown person to win was Roman Reigns beating Big E. So, yeah, I just... So, I don't really know why they did that, really. Um, what would Raw be like without the first brand split? Probably boring. I mean, that was the problem. The WWE product in early 2002 was just so still. So, yeah, it was... I, like I thought the build of WrestleMania wasn't very good, so it'd be kind of just more of the same, just pr it'd be pretty much exactly what it was like in the, the, the first few months of 2002, going to WrestleMania 18, so the product wouldn't have really changed, so I think it, cause I think the product just looked so stale and so boring, like some of the top stars that were still around had had better days, the, the show looked exactly the same as it did in 1998, it was just, yeah, I just think it would have, I think it would have got significantly worse. I think because I think the brand split is probably the best thing they could have done in two thousand two, because they shook the whole product up. Really, ah, this is a good question actually. Um, if the Undertaker was part of the Raw brand from two thousand two to twenty ten, what storylines do you want to see? So, so, so yeah. So if the Undertaker never went to SmackDown, I think the big one obviously is a big. Feud with John Cena in the mid to late 2000s, culminating a big WrestleMania match. Although, admittedly, they didn't particularly need the brand split to do that. That could have worked without a brand split, quite frankly. But I think Cena Undertaker, I know Cena Undertaker did happen at WrestleMania, but it was way too late in the game. So, say this happened in like 08, 09, maybe 10, or maybe even 07. God, just would have been so much better. Now, big one for me is a proper storyline and a proper feud with Chris Jericho. I feel like this is a big miss over the years. But Undertaker and Jericho never wrestled until 2009, which is kind of insane to think about, really. It took them until 2009. They only had two televised matches, and they were <clears throat> both on SmackDown as well. So I'm thinking... 2003, 2004, 2005 time. But yeah, probably 2003 would have been the best time to do it when Jericho was a heel. Um, so a Jericho undertake a feud for a couple of pay-per-views that year. That would have been... I would have loved to have seen that. Now, an interesting one for me is Undertaker versus Randy Orton later on in like 2008, 2009. So obviously this feud did happen in 2005 on SmackDown. But by 2008, Randy Orton was a much more established, much better, a top guy at last. And honestly, Undertaker was having some of his best in-ring in years during that period. So I'll say 07, 08, 09 were some of Undertaker's best ever years. So let's say 2008, pick that as a, pick that as a time period. Undertaker versus Randy Orton in 2008. I think that would have been great. Because I think the thing is, really, most of the guys that Undertaker could have feuded with wound up on SmackDown at some point anyway. So there's not actually that many people he missed out on facing, really. So I'll go with those three. Cena, Orton again, but Jericho. I, 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 no, I'll stop. Yeah, Jericho, say, oh, yeah, Undertaker Goldberg in late 2003 into 2004. That 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 was that was one that could have been interesting. That could have been an interesting rivalry. I don't know if he turned one of them heel for it. Maybe Undertaker can go back heel for a little bit. Defeat of Goldberg. 
Yeah, but that would that would have been cool actually. Undertaker versus Goldberg. Fifteen years before it actually happened and it was a disaster. But in all three or four, it would have been pretty good, in my opinion. Now, is there at least one guest host that you enjoy the most? So I'll give you two answers. I'll give you a wrestler and I'll give you a celebrity. So for the wrestler, I thought the wrestler that or the former wrestler I should say that did the best job was Jesse Ventura. He was it just felt like Jesse hadn't missed a beat. Jesse hadn't been in the spotlight for years at that point. I mean, the last time he was on WWF television was 1999 uh, for SummerSlam. But he wasn't a regular in the company since like 1990. And then obviously Jesse had done so much since then. He came back and he just slipped back into the Jesse Ventura role like he'd never left it. He was absolutely outstanding. He did an amazing job of promoting that show. And I love that when Vince and Jesse commentated on that Battle Royal, like the old Saturday Night Main Event days, the chemistry was still there in 2009. It was pretty awesome. And then as far as like, celebrity non-wrestler, Bob Barker did the best job by far. I'm telling you, Bob Barker was great. You know, this was a guy that knew television, was a true veteran and all that. And just did it absolutely outstanding. The price is raw. That segment was great. It really was. And this is a Jerry and Chris Jericho super serious character. And Bob Barker nearly got Chris Jericho at a crack. I mean, yeah, that was just brilliant. But Bob Barker was one of the few celebrities that got it. They knew exactly what the role was to enhance the show. Because some of them, you could tell a lot of them just could not give a shit. And was like, ugh. The bull appeared me, so I'll do it, sort of thing. But this is really beneath me, this silly wrestling crap. But Bob Barker absolutely knew what he was doing. So, yeah, I would say the best two guest hosts were Jesse Ventura and Bob Barker, definitely. Now, oh, here's a funny one, looking back now. Do you think that Raw will ever regain its glory with Triple H taking over the company? Well, that comment aged very well, didn't it? So, just so people don't know... This comment was made before all the recent Vince news has come out. And then, because we, we don't know what's going to happen with the company. Because, let's face it, my personal opinion, and I won't talk about this too much, that it's a matter of time before Vince takes back over creative. It just is. Triple H's reign isn't going to last very long. But as far as if Triple H is uh, capable of getting wrought with former glory, if by that you mean the sort of ratings they were getting in 98, 99, 2000, no, it's just unrealistic. Those sort of ratings you can't really get nowadays because if the television industry has changed. People's viewing habits have changed so much now. I mean, with the internet and YouTube and on-demand on demand stuff, you can pretty much watch anything online these days. So how many people are watching TV like they used to do 20 years ago sort of thing? And as far as creatively, no. Because Triple H is going to be much more better than Vince or Creative. Absolutely. But I just don't think Raw is going to get significantly better now. It, it, don't get me wrong, it is better now than when Vince was writing the show. But it's certainly not going to go back to 98, 99, 2000 levels. It's just not going to. And that's a simple, that's a simple thing. So Andre Iremaya, uh, what wrestlers do you think of when you say Raw? So the obvious one is Stone Cold Steve Austin. So I picked out four people here as... Who I would say, if it was a Mount Rushmore for Raw, these would be the four people on it. Uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin. I mean, Steve Austin is Raw's war. When you think of classic Raw's war, it's Stone Cold. I mean, everyone says, like, yes, the Attitude Era was a team effort. And yes, it was a team effort and all that. But during that hot, Austin was the one driving the train. Austin was the one that brought the fans back to the product. Austin was... It was Austin, Austin, Austin. Then if you've got to go off Austin, you also got to go off The Rock. So during the glory years of Raw, it was all about Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock. I mean, you look at all the iconic moments from 98, 99, 2000, even 2001. You would say most of them involved Steve Austin and The Rock somehow, somewhere. And then after that, for better or worse, you've got to say Triple H, right? I mean, after Stone Cold and The Rock went away... Triple H was the top guy on Raw, for, especially in the early brand split days of 03 or 04 or 05. Triple H was the man on Raw, for better or worse. I mean, I would argue worse, but you and, and you got to say he was a big deal during the Attitude Era as well. And then it, all the way into the Ruthless Aggression days. And 
He was up because he was on SmackDown for that year, wasn't he? In 08 in 09. But for the most part, for the best part of 10 years, he was a major part of Raw. And then the last one, John Cena. Love him or hate him. And a lot of people hate him. And a lot, a lot of people like him nowadays, apparently. Um, after after all the big stars went, Stone Cold Rock and all, after the Attitude Era went, um, Triple H started winding down. John Cena was the man on Raw for a good 10 years. I mean, Cena was the face of Raw for so long. And just, I funny, actually, I've actually done some research in this. The ratings actually came back up a little bit during Cena's rise. So the ratings started slowly dropping after 2001. And then they picked up again in 2005 and in 2006 when Cena was on top. So I, I honestly feel like Cena was the last guy really to draw new fans because Cena was... Cena brought in the new the kids of that time that weren't watching wrestling. Cena brought a new fan base in, in that time. And then obviously after 2007 they started dropping again. But Cena was a man on Raw for, from 2005, mostly into like 2015. So you can't... Uh, you, you've got to give the devil his due, haven't you, really, in, in regards to John Cena. So those are my four people. Austin Rock, Triple H, Cena. Um. <clears throat> Ah, how would Raw look if the brand split never ended in 2011? Ugh, I don't know, really. Ugh, it's a strange one, isn't it? Because, yeah, I don't know, because without SmackDown, did Daniel Bryan rise through the ranks? Does Sheamus come through? It's a strange. I, I'm, not, see, I'm not really too sure about that, really, to be honest. It's a bit like the early one of the original brand split. It probably would have... Probably would have just looked the same, really, to be fair. I mean, I don't think there would have been any significant creative changes or anything like that, to be fair. So I, I don't really know how... I'm not really sure how to answer that question. I'm not sure about that one. Which superstars would you like to see on Raw now? So I'm assuming you mean SmackDown, people to go over the Raw. And to be honest, it doesn't really matter now because <clears throat> whoever just shows up on the show's now anyway so for example kevin owens is facing roman reigns at the royal rumble right but kevin owens is being a raw guy this whole time kevin owens is not on the smackdown roster but he's just on on smackdown i mean the bloodline just show up on raw whenever it suits so i just feel like i just feel like it doesn't really matter now because they just do what they just do whatever they want now don't they really so there's no one on SmackDown I really want to see be drafted to Raw or anything like that. Because, like I say, it just doesn't really matter. It just seems whoever wants to show up on Raw or SmackDown, just do it. Because, for reasons. And that's just the way it is now. And you just got to accept it. Um, do you think Raw's never the same after the Attitude Era? Uh, yes, but then WWE wasn't the same after the Attitude Era. So I don't think... Uh, <clears throat> So in that regard, I don't think Raw's any different than the rest of the company was. Um, so I don't think the attitude was ending was actually the biggest factor of Raw's changes. I think like the biggest factor was uh, WCW Night Raw ending. Because now the whole landscape changed. Then there wasn't that direct competition anymore. And just even if it was subconsciously, WWE definitely, like Raw, <clears throat> definitely, Raw lost some edge. They took the foot off the gas pedal a li just a little bit because the theory you're not you're not going to run as fast without anyone chasing you. So it's like WWE put the handbrake on a little bit after the end of Nitro, and it just didn't quite have the same energy that it had before. But I feel like, but like I say, that obviously combined with the Attitude Era ending. But I feel like Nitro not being on the air anymore contributed more to Raw's you can call it a de decline yeah i would say it was a decline more than the attitude and more than anything i mean that was the biggest factor the lack of competition so good question so raw versus smackdown which was a better show each year 20 2002 to 2022 so for this one so i'm going to ignore the years where the brand put so i won't do from 2012 to 2015 i won't include those years because the brand split had ended and they weren't really unique shows anymore so 2002 i go smackdown for that one i mean i don't really feel like explain that one i think it's pretty if you're watching the shows or if you've seen the shows back you can pretty much determine quite easily the smackdown is a much better show than raw so smackdown for that also 
I'll go for SmackDown in 2003 as well. I mean, you know, all two and all three go to SmackDown. And then in all four, I would think Raw took. I think for Raw took over SmackDown in 2004 because SmackDown just declined so much in 2004. It was weird. They went from Brock Lesnar to Kurt Angle to JBL as WWE Champion. But God, yeah. So then I'll say 2005, I would go for overall. I think it was close this year though. Because I mean, both shows were quite close in quality that year. But I would give the slight edge to Raw that year. Then I'll say 2006, I would go for SmackDown. Because I think Raw was pretty bad. But SmackDown was actually a decent little wrestling show in 2006. Because I think the... At this point, Vince's priority is we've run on Raw, so I think creatively SmackDown could get away with a little bit more than Raw could. And 2007, I would say both weren't particularly good, but I'll say Raw was a little bit better, and um, not significantly better, but a little bit better. Then 2008, I would say both close, both shows were quite close to quality again. However. I would give the slight edge to Raw again this year. But I'll say like 2005. This was actually quite close. Neck and neck really. 2009 Smackdown. Because after the 2009 draft. Smackdown actually had a great little period of Edge, Jeff Hardy, CM Punk, Rey Mysterio, John Morrison um, and others. I can't remember everyone else that was on the roster at the time. But yeah they actually had a really good little show. Oh, Chris Jericho was there as well. That was the other one. And then Raw was just kind of eh in 09. I will say 10. Both shows were pretty bad. But Raw's was a little bit better. I suppose. Okay. Was it better or was it just less shit? I will say Raw was less shit. Then um, we'll go with uh, 2011. The last of the original brand split. I'll probably go with Raw again. Again, neither show is particularly great. But Raw's a little bit better. So let's skip into the modern brand split now. So... 2016, so I'll go for SmackDown. That was actually a really good period, to be fair. That's when Sm the initial SmackDown last one, the start of SmackDown Live up until about WrestleMania 33 was actually some really good TV from SmackDown. Raw wasn't really that bad either. The 2017, yeah, I'll go for Raw. I mean, neither show was good. But SmackDown was terrible in 2017. I mean, this is a, right in the Jinder Mahal's WWE Champion. Good God. That was just a really bad time period. Raw wasn't much better, but Raw was definitely better. Then 2018, I'll go for SmackDown. Because after this, that superstar shake-up, when they got Pete like Samoa Joe and all that, and Daniel Bryan had come out of retirement, SmackDown was not a great show. But it was a definitely a much better show than Raw was. Uh, 2019, see this is hard because this is when I was really just not watching the product, so I'd probably say, yeah I'd probably say Smackdown again, but neither show was really that good in 2019, but Smackdown was probably a little bit better than uh, 2020, that, that's Smackdown, that was, actually, that was actually another really good period. Right, the last half of the year when Roman Reigns a tribal chief for Jey so thing was starting. Then you had the awesome Bailey versus Sasha Banks feud. So, yeah, then Raw was just garbage in 2020. 2021? Hmm. Yeah, I guess SmackDown again. I mean, like I say, neither show was brilliant, but I think some people like Roman Reigns definitely carried SmackDown during that year. Then you had the Edge Seth Rollins feud. That was actually really good TV. Um, and then 2022, I would probably say, mm, that's a good one. Because I would say, mm, yeah, maybe Raw. Maybe Raw just a little bit more, but not significantly. But yeah, I, would def I think Raw was probably a bit better than SmackDown during that time period. So, right, okay, let's keep going. So we've got three more sets of questions, and then... Then we got Diesel 101 Raw. The Raw after WrestleMania X7 would have been a good idea if Stone Cold vs. The Rock vs. Triple H happened. And Austin never had that heel turn and Austin and Triple H feud with the WWE title. Yeah, yeah, why the hell not? I mean, that would have been a good time to do it. And I do feel like Triple H vs. Austin is Austin's first title feud would have made a lot more sense because, if you remember, No Way Out 2001, 
Storm Triple H beat Austin Cleet. Well, all right, it was clean for a street fight, but it was a street fight, so Triple H didn't cheat. So Triple H beating Austin at No Way Out. Um, so logically, that would have put Triple H in line to challenge Austin. But yeah, because I didn't really love Austin versus Rock happening the night after WrestleMania 17. Because it's like, in a way, it's like, why would you do that? Why would you just give the WrestleMania main event away the next night? So having the Triple H twist in there as well. I mean, you could have had some... Maybe you could have done an injury angle. Like, the, the Rock got injured in that match and had to go away instead of getting suspended by Vince for reasons. Um... So yeah, uh, yeah. Why the hell not? And um, did WWE really drop the ball with Vader after his 2012 return? No, I'd, I'd say I don't think so. I mean, he 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 came back. He did that one match of Heath Slater, didn't he? Doing the Heath Slater slagging the legends off Raw. But yeah, it's no, not really. I mean, what was he? What was he going? Was he going to have a run after that? No, he was pushing 60 at the time. Hadn't been a star in years. So he wasn't. He wasn't going to. Certainly wasn't going to come back for a run, was he? So, I don't think WWE dropped the ball from it at all. I think what they did run was perfectly fine. Um, <coughs> you know, my the only one that liked Nickelback's Raw theme. I like. I liked it. I didn't love it. Um, there's a weird thing that like, I don't know how many people my age think this, but for some reason, when I was growing up, a lot of people didn't like Nickelback, and I don't know why. Like, a lot of people I've talked to, like, even online or in person at the time, thought Nickelback sucked and I didn't get it. I, I don't love Nickelback as a band, but I like them. I mean, they've got some pretty good songs, but, but for some reason, and I don't, and I know I'm going completely off topic here, and this has got nothing to do with Raw, but, yeah, for some reason, Nickelback was so disliked in the 2000s, and I just don't understand it. Um, but as far as the song, was a... Is it, uh, which one was it? We're going out tonight. Is that the one? Is that the Nickelback one? It was a good song. It wasn't a great song. It wasn't one of the best raw things, but it wasn't a bad one by any means. I liked it. I didn't love it. Then your fa three favourite title wins, so I'll go back to what I said before. Uh, what did I have? I had number three, Dolph Ziggler cashing in in 2013. Austin beating The Undertaker after King of the Ring 99. And then obviously number one's obvious, Mankind beating The Rock for the WF title. And then fought on Raw in 2004. I thought it was good. I thought it was great. I mean, although ironically at the time, I, was, I used to complain about Raw on the internet, but I would definitely take Raw in 2004 over Raw now. I mean, you had some good... I mean, Chris Benoit had an all right title reign. It was kind of interesting. Um... The whole build-up of WrestleMania was pretty good with the Benoit, Triple H, Sean. You had the Randy Orton, Mick Foley story, which was the best thing on TV that year, in my opinion. Um, the whole Jericho, Christian, Jericho, Trish and Christian love story, that was pretty good as well. Um, then there's a weird, like, the Eugene character is weirdly getting hot. It did for some reason, I just it didn't. Looking back now, it doesn't make sense to me. But for a period, Eugene was actually really over, and I, I still not too sure why. I mean, the evolution was probably at its height. I mean, obviously, I think, like I said earlier, having Randy Orton, the Randy Orton face turn was horribly botched. But the Batista slow heel turn, face turn at the end of the end in two thousand five, really good. And um, Edge finally turning. Heel later on in the year was good because I think when he came back as a baby face that year it was kind of it was it was okay, but I, but he wasn't really going anywhere. Now there was there's some bad stuff for that year. I mean the whole Kane Lee and Matt Hardy storyline was terrible, and that's the one that hasn't aged very well at all. <laughs> oh did um and that was another miscarriage as well. Later on a miscarriage is ugh, that was pretty bad. Um, the Diva search was on that year, and that was just... They wasted so much TV time, the fucking Diva search in the summer of 2004, didn't they? Yeah. But, yeah, so overall, I would say good. There we go. Harlan, 24-94. Uh, best year and worst year for Monday Night Raw. So, best year... And this is strictly for the Raw television show, not necessarily the best show for WWE, WWF overall. So, best overall year for Raw has to be 1998. God, just... They were just so exciting. I mean, honestly, go back and watch... 
if I could recommend re-watching any year of Raw back to back in history would be 1998 because you see the Attitude Era had started but the formula was still being worked out at the start of the year I mean you got Austin rising the New Age Outlaws coming through this the Rocks act slowly slowly getting better D Triple H becoming a much bigger star in DX and trying to cement himself I mean there was so much awesome stuff going on I mean so called McMahon saga that's been talked about to death, but it was an amazing storyline. Just so much good stuff out there. The whole Undertaker Kane saga, brilliant story. The rise and, and the change of DX as well with Shawn Michaels going going away, and then the new DX form and all that. And then the Rock just the Rock just rising and rising and rising. The becoming the corporate champion by the end of the year. Uh, the rise of Mick Foley just so much good stuff I me mean, honestly just i was there's a period i would say the summer 1998 like so say after over the edge up until SummerSlam 1998 is probably the best period ever in raw history now for worst this is a tough one but i'll go i'll put my neck on the line and i'll say 2018 is the worst year because i feel like that 17 18 19 period all kind of blends in together as one long bad period even 2020 2021 as well but yeah 2018 because it's like do you remember yeah so was it december of 2018 where the mcmahon's had to come out and apologize for raw being so bad and then promising all these creative changes and all that and then nothing really fucking changed did it so that was, what was that four years ago yeah, so I would say that I would because I think I wrote it on where one of my match uh, match pick videos that I fought the twenty eight that yeah I'll go with twenty eight is probably the darkest days in the history of Raw, just bad bad bad. Then uh, okay, which segment is worse? Barely this is your life in twenty seventeen. So this is going back to something an earlier question where I'm holding these two back. The Bailey, this is your life in 2017, or the Bobby Lashley sister in 2018. Oh, both very bad segments. And do you know what? If you look very closely, when you look, if you, because I've I've never ever watched this these segments back, and I'm never going to. I'm just not. I'm just not going to do it, because I'm, I don't want to put myself through that. If you look closely, one of Bobby's Lashley's sister is actually. Was it, it's one of the I can't remember which one it is it's either Anthony Bones or Max Caster I can't remember which one it is but both bad segments I would say Bailey Alexa is a little bit worse because at least the Bobby Lashley's sister one was bad but no real harm done it was just a bad segment it didn't kill Bobby Lashley or anything like that but I feel like that Bailey segment ruined Bailey as a baby face I mean that was a huge creative fail wasn't it when um you got in Bailey, the most organic baby face in NXT, and turned her into a joke. And then the career was only salvaged because she turned heel a couple of years later, and now where she is now. But God, that yeah, I'll go there. This is your life segment. If I had to pick, they're both terrible. Don't get me wrong. Uh, do do not get me wrong on that one. But God, bad. Then okay, which was the best Raw roster from 2002 to 2008 and 2016 and now? So in the original brand split, I would probably say after the 2005 draft, so the second half of 2005. I mean, wow, look at this talent. So you had John Cena on top, Triple H, Kurt Angle was on Raw for a bit, if you remember, Shawn Michaels, Edge, um, the Big Show, Kane, then you had young guys like Carlito and Chris Masters and all that. Wow, what a really stacked roster that one was, really. Then I would say from the last few years. So, I'll, I guess after the Superstar Shake-Up of 2017. I mean, I, I feel like SmackDown got screwed. So, SmackDown, so two, three big players came up. So, already on the roster you had Brock Lesnar, Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns. Uh, Samoa Joe was there Finn Balor was there um, but then to add to that now you had Bray Wyatt you had uh, you had The Miz you had Dean Ambrose you had Braun Strowman that was actually a pretty good roster really looking back um, so yeah I'll go for original brand split as their 2005 second half then the new newish brand split 2017 
Um, who will be the next world champion for Raw? Hmm. See, it's interesting because a Raw going to have its own world champion ever again? That's that's a big question, isn't it? Be. That's a big question that's been on people's minds for a while. Are they going to split the titles anytime soon? So, I think the next champion... Right, we'll talk about this later on the week when I talk about Raw Rumble predictions, but I think Cody Rose is going to be the next champion, right? I mean, right now, there's, he's the only one who's going to dethrone Roman Reigns, I believe. Um, so, But the question is, is, Roman, is, is Cody Rose going to be a champion on both shows, or is he going to be just a champion on Raw? So... If they don't split the titles, it's going to be Cody Rhodes. If they do split the titles and Raw has its own world champion, I think Seth Rollins is due for a title reign. So that would be kind of ideal if if somehow Cody Rhodes could have one title and Seth Rollins could have the other title. That would be how I would go anyway. And who was the best GM of Raw history? So I'll say strictly the general manager. So Because my favourite is actually Commissioner Foley. But if we're talking... Uh, if the title is strictly GM, there would be Eric Bischoff. I mean, Eric Bischoff was awesome from 2002 to 2005. Bischoff in WWE was just wow. That was really shocking at the time, wasn't it? Bischoff being there. And I think he did a great job. I mean, also, close second, obviously, Brad Maddox. Not. Does anyone, does anyone remember that? Does anyone remember that when Brad Maddox was the Raw General Manager? He has to be the worst of all time, right? Surely. But yeah, Eric Bischoff did a great job. Had three good years in the role. Yeah, he was probably the best GM Raw ever had. Um, so yeah. Then we've got the last set of questions from Jay Shepardson. Most underrated and overrated Raw matches. So, overrated's hard. Um, I'm going to say this, right? I think the Trish Stratus versus Lita main event of December 2004 is pretty overrated as a Raw match. Um, especially by WWE. It kind of gets celebrated as this big revolutionary match that main evented Raw for the very first time. Even though it's not actually the first women's main event Raw. Because that was Lita versus Stephanie McMahon. But yeah, it gets hurdled as this huge historic match and revolutionary match. But in reality, it's a good TV match. Honestly, like, not even joking, that is what it is. A perfectly fine, acceptable television match. Nothing more, nothing, nothing more, and nothing less, really. I mean, I'll give it, like, three stars, and I think that's fine. Um, underrated Raw matches. Ooh, there's a few. So, I think Marty Gennetti versus Doink from uh, 1993, a total three falls match count. Shawn Michaels versus Marty Gennetti from July 1996. So not the 93 matches, but an actual match that happened in 1996. That's a nice one. Um, that Undertaker in Austin versus uh, New Age Outlaws versus Kane of Mankind versus Rocket Deal or Brown from August of 1998. That's one of the best television matches of the entire Attitude Era. Um, Benoit versus Austin on the Raw. Because bef- everyone remembers the Smackdown match of Edmonton. But they had an amazing Raw match in Calgary, the, the Raw before. So that one, wow, that was a great match. It really was a fantastic match. Um, Evolution versus Shawn Michaels, Mick Foley, Shelton Benjamin and Chris Benoit from right before Backlash 2004. I've done this on the match pick in the past. Wow, that match was great. Really was. Now, a match I always remember that doesn't get enough love uh, it was a tag team match in oh, it was February of 2005. Shawn Michaels and Randy Orton versus Edge and Christian. If you've never seen that match, check it out. Honestly, that match is actually fantastic. It really is. Um, so, Shawn Michaels versus Jeff Hardy, February 2008. That's a really good match. Honestly, a really good match. Edge versus Christian in 2010. The only time Edge and Christian wrestled after Christian came back. It was in Tor- uh, was it in Toronto? I want to I want to say it was, you know, but that was a great Raw match that doesn't really get much attention. I mean, I could go on and I'm going to stop there because I don't want to really blab on for too long because um this video's already going long. But those are some decent picks. Most underrated and overrated Raw moments. So overrated Raw moment. I'm going to say it again just. That Austin beer bath moment in uh, 1999. Honestly, it was a good segment, yeah. 
But I, like I say, I've literally seen it being called the best moment in Raw history. And it's like, no, it wasn't. It wasn't the be- No, it wasn't. Like, not at all. Not at all. It was fine. It was good. But, yeah, honestly, I just honestly find that moment ridiculously overrated. I really do. Now, underrated, this is the, I'm going to go Undertaker turn a heel at the end of 2001. So, it was in Raw in Oklahoma with Jim Ross. It was going to join the Vincent Man Kiss My Ass Club. Undertaker came out. Uh, spoke about all these past wrestlers like Hogan, Warrior, Savage Piper, Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels. Talk about how at some point in time they all kissed Vincent Man's ass, but the one who kissed his ass the most was the Undertaker. Then he asked Jim Ross a simple question: Are you going to kiss his ass? No. Do you want to kiss his ass? No. And they asked him: Are you better than me then? And then he punches Jim Ross. Beats down Jim Ross and then forces Jim Ross to kiss Vincent Man's ass. And I think, because obviously, the, I think the American bar has grown still by 2001. And yeah, it was just a great time for the Undertaker to switch heel and chain. So yeah, that's honestly, it doesn't get talked about that much really, but that was a super underrated moment for me. Um, fourth on the May 25th night, like May 25, 2009 Raw. So I had to look this up to see what you're talking about, but now so. And I remember, so this was the infamous LA Lakers Raw. So, from what I gather, and obviously I don't really know what I'm talking about, so WWE had booked Raw in a booked Raw in Los Angeles or something like that. But uh, the LA Lakers had won a playoff game, man. They had to have the arena that Monday night, um, and apparently, like Stan Kroenke offered offered the uh, pay for, offered Vince to pay for a new venue and all that. So a normal person would be like, okay, right, fair enough, we're getting compensated for this. But Vince is not a normal person. Vince is a petty, a petty loser. So Vince, uh, Vince was not, Vince was not happy about losing this battle. This was his arena, damn it. He booked this arena, and he wasn't accepting the fact that that he was made to change venues. I can't remember where they put the venue to instead, but. Um, it was supposed to be, obviously the Staples Center was the original one, obviously. So the Vince just used that segment to take the piss out of the LA Lakers and they had a, they had a, they had the wrestlers dress up in a basketball outfit. I can't remember who the other team was. I don't know, I did that. But this was the, inf- this was, that was just Vince being childish and vindictive, wasn't it? That was the role where Mr. Kennedy dropped Randy Orton on his shoulder and ended up getting fired for it, didn't he? Um, so yeah, that was just Vince. That basically that was just Vince being childish and vindictive. Who'd have thought it? Eh? Nothing much has changed in the last thirteen years, has it? Then how? That's a good question. So right, so your last question was best and worst year in raw history, which I've just answered. I said nineteen ninety eight and twenty eighteen. So the last question in the Q and A. This is actually a good one, to be fair. How long ago should a raw went back to two hours? I am all that's in my opinion. It should have been when they brought back the brand extension. Yeah, I'll go that one. But wait, to be fair, I think the, the answer is never to go three hours to begin with. But they went the three hours to begin with, so it doesn't really matter now, does it? Um, but yeah, I would yeah I would say that that makes the most sense to be fair because when they did the brand extension, a large chunk of the roster was on SmackDown now, so they had less stars than before and. It would just got really hard to fill the TV time. I would say, if it's not that, I would say in 2020 when the pandemic happened and there was no fans, because God, Raw just Raw was bad enough, but no fans in the arena. A three-hour Raw just became a massive chore, didn't it? Really. So if it wasn't 2016 Brands extension, an alternative answer could have been at the start of the pandemic. And that's a wrap, guys. So. A two-hour video. I was not expecting to go that long. I thought I might go an hour and a half, but I went over two hours. So if you watch this entire video, thanks for watching. Um, so I think next from here going on forward, when I do the Q and A's. I'm just gonna do a general wrestling thing because I, I don't think there's any real theme Q and A's left to do. I'll pretty, I suppose I could do best of SmackDown, but I might do that at some point, but. Definitely the next one's going to be a more general theme. So I'll probably do that one around WrestleMania season. Um, so I am going to do Royal Previous House Predictions late this week. That'll probably be either Thursday or Friday, most likely Thursday. And obviously Royal Rumble 2023 review, as I do all the time anyway. 
And that's it guys, so thanks for watching and until next time, peace.